start distributing that. Thank you. In any case, I'm very low tech um, and basic. I'll just be talking. Um, this is this is for a few. I do. No, no, I don't have that one. But it's it's fine. We can live without it. said, um, I'm coming from uh, a, a North American uh, training and situation. My own background is primarily in French structuralism uh, and in North American style um, linguistic anthropology, ultimately coming out of the work of Franz Boas and Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Worf. Okay. Okay. Um, And one thing, one of the reasons I wanted to be here, uh, I, I have the very strong impression, and, and you can tell me whether something parallel has happened in this part of the world, but certainly in Western Europe and North America, through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, questions of language and, and culture, uh, which are necessarily questions of diversity, languages are different from each other. Does that difference matter? People's ways of life in different places and different times are different from each other. Do those differences matter? The answer uh, in the dominant uh, intellectual paradigm in the West in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s was no. These differences don't matter. What matters is what everyone has in common. That's the only thing that really matters. Uh, <coughs> linguistic and cultural differences are if you like, foam on the ocean of mind. Uh, they're superficial. And this was true in linguistics, dominated by the, by the Chomsky and the transformational uh, paradigm. It was certainly true in cognitive psychology, where cross-cultural psychology was, was a very minor part of cognitive uh, psychology. And it was true in the main thrust of what were called the cognitive sciences. Uh, the model being that the way to understand the human mind was essentially as a calculating machine, a kind of computer. Uh, and that's what cognition meant. Cognition meant fundamentally calculation. This is, if, if you're looking for a source, this is said particularly clearly in the work of, uh, of Steven Pinker, um, who is the, certainly the best-selling author on cognitive science and one of the clearest and most extreme exponents of what you might call hard cognitive science. In this situation, uh, questions about linguistic diversity, questions about cultural diversity were considered purely, if you like, practical political questions and not theoretical questions because differences among cultures were held to be, and among languages in particular, were held to be uh, mere surface issues, whereas all the deep structures, what mattered was um, all, all the deep structures were, were universal and shared by the human mind in general. <coughs> this started to fall apart. And, and I, I remember talking to, see, I'm, I'm a fan of Benjamin Lee Worf. I read him in secondary school and thought it made a lot of sense, the idea that, that of language that's built very differently would tend to orient at least the habitual, lazy thought of most people, most of all of us most of the time, in its grooves, if you like. Which doesn't mean that a language limits what's possible to think. It simply means that you will use the tools available to you as aids in thinking. And, if, and, the, and the language you speak offers you tools, ways to put things together, which are different from language to language. Uh, 
Now, maybe underneath that there's a universal cognitive structure. That's fine. But what Worf, it seemed to me, was saying was that there was no reason not to think that people who speak a language with no tense would construct their ideas about time, their concepts about time, the same way as people in a who speak a language with obligatory tense that forces you constantly, whether you want to or not, and whether it's relevant or not, forces you constantly to refer to the relationship between te the temporal relationship between what you're talking about and the moment of speaking, uh, past, present, future. You know, when we speak uh, a European language, you constantly have to do that. So when you're speaking Kwakwala, uh, spoken in Vancouver Island uh, in BC, in British Columbia and Canada, you don't have to do that. You're free, or when you speak Chinese, you're free, uh, any form of Chinese, as far as I know, you're free not to refer to when something happened in relation to when you're talking, if it's not relevant. These things seem to me important, uh, and, and, and differences that were worth marking. And whenever you raise them, and I've had this experience many times, with most linguists and most psychologists, their reaction was simply, as well, I'll, I'll, I'll quote a friend of mine who, who was teaching linguistics at the time, was teaching linguistic anthropology, and the textbooks, as she, as she put it, said, wharf. <laughs> Worf is an idiot, uh, and, and he's been treated as an idiot uh, through much of the literature. So, so uh, you know, because he didn't have a formal degree uh, in linguistics, he was a he was a chemical engineer who worked for an insurance company, but he was also a very very fine, highly trained linguist, uh, a close associate of of Sapir. As he replaced Sapir for a year when Sapir was sick. Um, he wrote what are still the standard descriptive grammars of some Mexican languages, as, as well as, as work on Hopi. Um, anyway, uh, a, a lot of my own work on Wharf has come out of anger. I'll, I'll, I'll say that frankly, um, uh, at, the way, at the way the poor man was treated after his death. He died at 44 years old, which now seems like a baby to me. So. Through the, through the 1980s and well into the 1990s, the position was basically, it doesn't matter. These differences don't matter. It started to fall apart <clears throat> around the time, well, coming up to the Wharf Centenary, uh, which was 1997. And all of a sudden, people were starting to propose uh, much more serious analyses of the relation between particular languages and cultures, how people thought. Psychologists were starting to, to propose new kinds of experiments based on uh, grammatical categories that all of a sudden were starting to show wharf effects, as they call them. This has increased and increased. Now, all through this period, there were a few brave souls, like, for instance, Rosalind Frank, who continued to ask these questions, which she wasn't supposed to ask. Um, Martha Hardman in Florida, uh, if I may just mention her. My own teacher, Paul Friedrich, uh, at the University of Chicago. They're, they're, and, and of course, people like Del Hines uh, continued to work on this. But they were a small minority, a little group. It started to explode in the late 90s and has continued to grow since then. So that now it's become quite respectable in psychology to try to find and to actually find what are sometimes called wharf effects. Um, my, and, and all of a sudden, there are groups all over Western Europe and North America looking at these questions. So I'm very interested in the fact that around the same period, uh, in uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, you started to have similar questions being raised uh, in a serious way. And again, that continues on to today. My own, my own feeling is that there was a territory that was fenced off, a potentially rich and fertile territory that was fenced off or, or that, was, that was covered up. It's been uncovered. It's been, now we're allowed to ask these questions. And as a result of the, at least in, in, in Western Europe and North America, as a result of this, there are the equivalent of mushrooms springing up everywhere. Uh, 
many of which are not, don't know each other. But it's a real change in, in, in the zeitgeist, if I may use that word. Um, so that's one reason I'm very happy to be here. Uh, now, I was coming here hoping primarily to learn. And I was shocked, I must say, to, be, to see that I was put on as the first speaker after Adam. Um, it, it's very flattering. And uh, to use a word Adam just used, it's very, very intimidating. Um, given my own background, and you know, I know something about Lublin uh, ethnolinguistics. I know far less about, for instance, the Moscow ethnolinguistic school. Um, so given that, that I had assumed that I'd be talking after listening to a lot of people, uh, I fear that what I'm about to say, that some of it may be irrelevant for many of you, and uh, in other cases, I may be teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, which is a good, complex uh, English metaphor. But um, here we go. Uh, I'll start by quoting the quote from Gadamer that's on the poster for the colloquium. If by entering foreign language worlds we overcome the prejudices and limitations of our previous experience of the world, this does not mean that we leave and negate our own world. Like travelers, we, re we return home with new experiences. I certainly uh, want to endorse the notion that different languages constitute different worlds, which is to say different ways of organizing perception and conception. Uh, to quote my own teacher, Paul Friedrich, I feel that American English, as opposed to British English, and English of any major dialect, is against Russian. And both languages, as against the Tarascan language of Mexico, constitute different worlds. Each natural language is a different way, not only of talking, but of thinking and imagining and of emotional life. Now, these lines are implicitly referring back to a formulation by Friedrich's own uh, hero and his inspiration, Edward Sapir, who wrote in 1921, when we pass from Latin to Russian, we feel that it is approximately the same horizon that bounds our view, even though the near familiar landmarks have changed. When we come to English, we seem to notice that the hills have dipped down a little, yet we recognize the general lay of the land. And when we have arrived at Chinese, it is an utterly different sky that is looking down upon us. An utterly different sky. If we take this analogy seriously, then passing between languages is less like traveling from country to country than from planet to planet. Translators are more like astronauts than like travel writers. To pursue the analogy, the seriousness and risks of interplanetary travel, the enormous investment of a large part of one's life, mean that I have to diverge from Gadamer's characterization of the translator as a traveler. It makes translation sound too much like travel writing. On the contrary, to translate is not to traverse or to visit a place, but to have dwelt in profoundly different territory to have survived the crossing, which, if not always dangerous, always requires the full measure of your personal resources. To have survived under a new sky, breathed its air, learned the ways of its denizens, and to some degree have been transformed by this, so that when you do come home, you are not the same person, and home no longer looks the same. The proper comparant for travel, uh, sorry, for translation then is not travel writing, but something more like ethnographic fieldwork. And I can't help thinking of Levi Strauss, who begins the book of his travels, Je hais les voyages et les explorateurs. Et voici que je m'apprête à raconter mes expéditions. I hate travelers and explorers. And here I am ready to start telling about my expeditions. Uh, the French word aïr, I hate, is a really strong verb. It's not used a lot. Uh, it, it's a real hatred. Yeah. <laughs> the closest we come to ethnographic fieldwork in the universe of texts is what we call philology. I remember one day talking on the phone with Charles Malamud, who's a French scholar of ancient India. And I asked him what he was up to these days. And he replied, oh, moi, je reste dans mon village. <laughs> 
Me, I, I just stay in my village. Uh, his village is the Veda, is the most ancient uh, Indian texts. And in, in his practice and the practice of some others, particularly the French school of classicism, like Jean, the people like Jean-Pierre Bernard and Marcel Détienne, philology is, is the ethnography of a textual world. Given the theme of this meeting, I'd like to distinguish between what we might, what might, what we might call external and internal perspectives on translation. From the external perspective, the question is what does and doesn't get translated, the economic and historical role of translation, the power relations implied in this reality. In his 2011 book, Is That a Fish in Your Ear?, the translator David Bellows points out how massively a few languages are translated from, with English these days clearly dominant uh, during our historical period. From an external point of view, translation is like any other human interaction whether between societies or between individuals. It can be shown to involve power, differential, power differentials and exploitation. <clears throat> this aspect of translation as violence, or as attempted conquest, or in George Steiner's word, as invasion, has been stressed in much recent translation theory. Uh, and you have it in, in the quote from Valdimir Makura uh, in the workshop prospectus. But this is a quality translation shares with other activities, including political interaction, which can mean war, economic interaction, which can mean exploitation, and personal interaction, which can mean bullying. If we take seriously the idea that language specifics matter, that different languages are actually different and imply or presume differing worlds, that these statistics don't tell us very much about the actual work of translation. This must be considered from what I am calling an internal perspective. And this is the perspective that gives us what is distinctive about translation as opposed to other kinds of activities. Here I would argue that the differentium specificum of translation is not its ability to go out and bring back treasure. There are many other ways to bring back treasure. Rather, translation requires a distinctive kind of work. The intimate engagement with at least two languages, their sounds, their categories, their grammatical patterns, and uh, their afferent cultures, in their specificity and their differences from each other. That is, translation assumes, indeed embodies, a practical philology, a willingness to read slowly, as Nietzsche puts it. In these respects, translation practice can be compared to love. As Robert Frost says of poetry, the figure is the same as for love. It begins in delight and ends in wisdom. Love, too, can be shown to involve power differentials, differences in real and emotional capital, aggression, exploitation, sometimes conquest, sometimes destruction. But even at its worst, we would not call it love if it did not involve intense engagement. This is suggested in the very word philology, the love of words and is presupposed and carried out in the actual work of translation. The history of translation theory mirrors the history of ideas about language diversity. Um, and I'll just say a word about the, the, the standard model now for thinking about translation uh, theoretically. It's basically a romantic 19, early 19th century model, and I have no trouble with that myself. It, it's Schleiermacher's model from, I believe, 1830s, 1820s, 1820, 1820, 1812. The translator has to choose either to take the author by the hand and bring him toward the reader, so that the author changes, so the author is transformed, and that's what's now called in English domesticating translation, or in French, it's interesting. The terms domesticating and foreignizing, which are very, very widely used in translation theory, you can't translate them. <laughs> they don't translate directly. In French, the target language, the word target is cible, and they talk about cibliste. It's a horrible word, but a cibliste translation. You either take the author and bring the author to the reader. So the reader doesn't have to do any work. The reader reads a, a, a piece that's easy to read. Or you take the reader by the hand and lead him or her toward the author. 
which means you produce a text that is stranger, that is more bizarre, that is less fitting the standards of the time and the culture of the reader. In French, this is it's called foreignizing in English, which has a lot of problems with it. But in French, it's called source ist, sourcist. Uh, and sourcist suggests sorcellerie and sorcier, uh, a sorcerer, um, a sorcellerie. Uh, so it suggests, it also in French suggests something like uh, a magical spell um, uh, that's going to be thrown over the reader. Uh, I, I'm not sure people are explicit about that at all, but that's what it suggests to me. Uh, as an anthropologist and, uh, if you like, an autodidact philologist, I lean strongly toward the uh, foreignizing or, or sourcist better source the, part, the important thing is not that it's foreign, but that it is, it tries to be faithful. It tries to give the reader an idea of the original. Um, uh, I lean toward, strongly toward what the Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset called ugly translations, or as some of us have called them thick translations. Um, these are philologist translations. And I'm reminded of the story of Ezra Pound, the, the great American poet, who was a great poet in, in spite of his political views, um, who was very poor living in Paris and found uh, a Latin, an early Latin translation, 17th century, 16th century Latin translation of Homer, and bought it for one franc or something, 10 francs, I think. And it was considered a crib. Every word. In the, in the Odyssey is translated by one word in Latin. And you can do that between Greek and Latin. It produces a horrible Latin, a very, very strange Latin. But Pound thought, in many ways, that was the best kind of translation. Because through it, he knew Latin very well. He was a professor of Romance languages. And he could read Latin easily. He could get through the Latin to the Greek through that. And, and his whole theory of translation was based on that experience. And, and much of his poetry as well is based on that experience. To read a translation into one's own language is to visit another world briefly. To do a translation, to, per, per, to create a translation, requires not just visiting, but actually dwelling in another world to the point that you get to know it well. Never well enough, but well enough to make something, uh, to make something of it. If reading a translation is like travel writing, doing a translation is comparable, as I said before, to long-term field ethnography. The act of translation then presupposes a philology, in the old sense of a discipline of editing texts, requiring overall knowledge and, to the extent possible, understanding of the language of the text, its internal structuring, its poetic devices, its social and historical contexts, the lived world from which it emerges. It presupposes long-term engagement with the text and its world. Uh, I'll quote another very famous quote from Nietzsche in the second preface to Morgan Rutte uh, in 1886. It's not for nothing that I was, this is my attempt at a translation, having read other translations. So it's, not, it's not for nothing that I was a philologist. Perhaps I am one still. A teacher of slow reading. Philology is a... Uh, Ein Lehrer des langsamen Lesens. So there's heavy, heavy alliteration in, in that text, which of course disappears in almost any translation uh, of it. Philology is that honorable art that requires from its devotees one thing above all, to step to one side, to leave oneself time, to be still, to be slow. A goldsmith's art and knowledge of the word which has to do fine and foreseeing work and attains nothing if it does not attain it lento. Philology itself teaches how to read well, that is slowly, deeply, looking before and behind with afterthoughts, with doors open, with delicate fingers and eyes. I'm struck by the fact that some of the sharpest critiques of domesticating translation have come from philologists. I'll give two examples. Uh, in 1654, the classicist Gilles Ménage is, is supposed to have made the following comment on the translations of uh, 
of Perrault d'Ablancourt, who was the most famous trans French translator of the 17th century, uh, and who was proud of changing ancient Greek and Roman texts to make them seem more French, to improve their taste, because 17th century French taste was the best taste, to remove shock, shocking, terrible things that you found in ancient texts. And often to turn them, if they were poetry, to turn them into Alexandrians. So you, you had a text that was very easy to assimilate, to metabolize for a, for a, for a French reader of the period. Uh, referring to these texts, Gilles Ménage said, Elle me rappelle une femme que j'ai beaucoup aimé à Tours, et qui était belle mais infidèle. Uh, they remind me of a lady that I knew once in Tours, who I, who I liked a lot in Tours. She was beautiful but unfaithful. And Les Belles Infidèles has, of course, become the, 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 the label for this kind of translation, uh, which are beautiful and unfaithful. But it was Ménage who was a philologist who, who invented the term. Uh, in the Hellenist Second example is the Hellenist Richard Bentley in England, who is supposed to have remarked directly to the author, to Alexander Pope, soon after the publication of Pope's Iliad in 1715, which is still an Iliad that is widely used and widely read in English. Bentley said, it is a pretty poem, Mr. Pope, but you must not call it Homer. <laughs> So many of the most famous, the most, at this point, cliched criticisms of domesticating translation have come from philologists who were intimate with the original texts and the world of the texts. And so we're very sensitive to what was lost uh, in the translation and also what was added. The same kinds of problems, the same kinds of indeterminacy, indeterminacy affect philology itself as, as they do the practice of translation. This usually goes unremarked, but um, there is now a school of radical philology. Uh, one of its exponents is Sean Gerd, uh, an American expert on Greece, on, on ancient Greece. <clears throat> I just wanted to raise this question here. In the announcement for this meeting, one of the questions raised is what role is played here by subsequent translations of a given work produced at different times? The Bible, Hamlet, Heart of Darkness. Given that the original stays the same, but does the original stay the same? A choice has always been made as to which original one starts from. Uh, there. There have been great disputes over what should and shouldn't be in the Hebrew Bible, and there continue to be. Uh, certainly, there are arguments about which lines in Hamlet may or may not be authentically Shakespeare, uh, and exactly how you read lines that are often ambiguous, and sometimes they'll be printed in different early texts with one letter differing, which completely changes the meaning. And Heart of Darkness apparently took years and years and years for Conrad to write, having assimilated his own horrible experiences in Central Africa. And there were different variants before the final text was produced. We have now something in literary theory called genetic criticism, which tries to look at the production of the text. So it's not clear, even there, that you always have a fixed original. How much time do I have left? Okay, then I'll run very quickly. I was going to give you examples of the, the, the degree of personal implication and the contradictions that this can involve are particularly acute in the case of texts from oral traditions. Uh, in 1905, addressing the joint meeting of the American Anthropological Association and the American Philological Society, I don't think the two have met together since 1905, uh, but they did meet together then. Franz Boas uh, delivered a joint talk, and he affirmed the centrality of language and textual work for studies of peoples without writing. And I'll quote him. <coughs> According to the canons of philological research, would not the investigator who is not able to read the classics 
be barred from the number of serious students. Still, this is the position which has confronted anthropology up to the present time. There are very few students who have taken the time and who have considered it necessary to familiarize themselves sufficiently with native languages, to understand directly what the people whom they study speak about, what they think and what they do. There are fewer still who have deemed it worthwhile to record the customs and beliefs and the traditions of the people, of the people in their own words thus giving us the objective material which will stand the scrutiny of painstaking investigation. I think it is obvious that in this respect, anthropologists have everything to learn from you, the philologists. The time must come when we must demand from the serious student the same degree of philological accuracy which has become the standard in your sciences. What many linguistic anthropologists and most folklorists do is to seek to transform a performance in one language into a written text in another. This requires a number of stages, which one can enter in on at any stage. Uh, very, very briefly, I just want to run through the stages that you have to go through to deal with uh, a written, written text. The preliminary stage is, of course, preparation. Why do you want to record this particular tradition? What do you know about it? Often you have a language to learn, a civilization to get to know, as well as theories and methods to try and master. This usually involves a commitment of years. In fact, it usually involves a complete orientation of your life. We have to ask, what will this effort get you? In our world, one rarely undertakes this kind of work as a direct means of sustenance. Unlike most kinds of professional translation, you can't make a living at it without some kind of academic or research position, and usually without some kind of external funding. This is preparatory. The first actual stage of the work is to be there, what's often called participant observation, but which often turns out to be observant participation. It's necessary to interact with people, to share their life to some degree, to work out together why they should allow you to be there at all. We call this ethnography. This stage includes the actual recording, formerly only by pen, then by tape recorder or other audio, audio device, now often by video, of one or more performances, that is, actualizations of texts. The specific circumstances, as well as the contribution or distortion due to the presence of the researcher, will affect the performance itself. In the field, you're dealing with a real person, a singer or a storyteller, and in some cases, the engagement is long-term and intense. I remember the folklorist of Ireland, the late Bu Almqvist, telling me that the hardest part of his work was that his so-called informants, that is the storytellers, who were friends with whom he had worked over many years, were old and dying, and he missed them. And that was the hardest thing about being a folklorist in Ireland. In the case I'm using as an example here, well, I won't go into my own background. Um, I'm, I've got a uh, good, you, the handout you have is from um, a, a ritual performance uh, done in the central Himalayan uh, region of Kumaon, which is right next door to Nepal, but on the Indian side, just west of Nepal, um, which is a, a, a series of, of chants, songs, declamations that bring a god to speak through someone's voice, through, through someone's mouth. It's, it's a spirit possession ritual. It's a way of consulting the regional gods. And this is, this is not my own recording. I'm, I'm a very v bad video videographer. Uh, this is from uh, my colleague, Franck Bernet, who's a French ethnomusicologist. But it, give, it gives you an idea of what the thing actually looks and sounds like. Um, 
So, I'm giving you two verses out of a much longer text, obviously. Uh, performed the nights of April 1st to 2nd, 1982. Uh, and I could play you the actual sound of it, but I don't think there's time. Um, maybe, you know, if people are curious, we can do more at another point, uh, or, or, you know, privately. Uh, once you have a recording, the usual next step is just obviously transcription. Given our historical dependence on writing, the audio and perhaps aspects of the video and the event as it was lived will be inscribed. Here there are many choices to make. In many cases, as simple and potentially consequential as the choice of alphabet, because it's not ever clear whether you should, in a case like this, whether you should transcribe in, in the local Devanagari alphabet, which has its problems, or some version of the Latin alphabet, uh, especially in a, in a tradition that's an oral tradition that doesn't have a fixed written form. Uh, do you transcribe in a rich phonetic system, noting much of what may not be semantically pertinent, or a strictly phonological system based on some previously established theory of the structure of this language, which is richer in understanding, but potentially leaves out expressive features. The choice was a bone of contention, for instance, between Boaz and Sapir for many years. Transcription. The reduction of sound to writing is a hideously long, fussy, and difficult task. And um, I don't know if this will work or not. Let's see. Sorry, I don't have it. It's a, it's a little image of, of a cat typing, which you see sometimes on Facebook. Uh, and it says, oh, you're transcribing that yourself. You must have lots of time. Um, and the cat's going like this. Uh, it's awful, transcription. It takes forever. Nobody can believe how long and slow and, and maddening transcription is. Uh, good. And it always involves painful philological choices. Fine. So what you have on one side, the stuff in the mysterious alphabet, is a page from a transcription of these verses done by my, my research assistant in the field, Sri Indra Singh Nagy in the Devanagari alphabet, and you also have a few little additions, commentaries on, in my hand there. To him, it would have been utterly meaningless to try to transcribe this in Latin, Latin characters. So we ended up with a text. It's completely non-formatted, if you like. It's just one word after another. Um, Okay, then there's the question, the question of how you present the text. Uh, oh yes, well the philology proper uh, involves, I mean I can't begin to talk about the, the, the implications and the, and the complexity and the enormity of trying to do philology of a text in a context, in a particular cultural and social context. One point that stands out in the philology of many oral texts, those that are not memorized word for word, and many oral texts are memorized word for word uh, in many traditions, but in this case they're not, they're formulaic, they're performed slightly differently each time, is that this is one bard among many and one performance out of a bardic career. The stereotypical audience has heard this, this, this the Twilight song, which this is from, it's a moment, uh, it's a, it's a song to the coming to the falling twilight, uh, which begins the ritual, has heard this many times uh, out of a number of different mouths. Here, the intertextuality is dense and commanding and unavoidable. 
If I had time, I could give you samples of parallel verses from 12 performances by 10 bards. And obviously, this kind of sampling is infinitesimal compared to the totality of what's going on. <clears throat> but even broader than this, since we don't know in advance what aspects of life resonate in the text, the philology of a living text requires a general ethnography, potentially without limits. Uh, and I'm not sure that people who are outside of the field of anthropology appreciate the absolute enormity of trying to understand people's lives. Uh, it's, it's everything. It's, it's the universe. It's, uh, and, and you have to try to carve out some comprehensible piece from that. Now, I find it helpful to have a text as the center of that work. Um, again, to quote Robert Frost, uh, a momentary stay against confusion, if you like. There's been a lot of work in North America uh, within linguistic anthropology and anthropological linguistics, I'm not sure I want to make a distinction, on how you present oral texts. Uh, the work of Del Himes, Dennis Tedlock, and, and their schools, and, and that are often called ethnopoetics, are very concerned with trying to seize not only the referential meaning, but also the, present, the, the, the form, the poetic form of oral texts, whether it's a narration, a song, or, or, or another genre. This is maybe the major thrust in uh, North American ethnopoetics, and, and I just I call your attention to it. Uh, to the work particularly of Himes and Tedlock and others that have, uh, that have followed them. Uh, in the case of the verses you have here, uh, a great deal of the structuring was already clear in the performance. Uh, he'll sing a few verses and then beat on the drum, in, in this case, and sing a few more and, and beat on the drum. So there are a series of phrases grouped together, divided one from the other by a series of drum beats. This is not how all such performances are structured, but it's the case for how this guy, how Kamal Ram, performs his Twilight Song, and you have that in the Kumauni uh, in the handout. Unfortunately, some of the diacritical marks did not reproduce properly. You'll just have to take my word for it uh, as to the sound. Translation proper, passing from one language to another, only arrives after all of this other work has been done. And this, again, involves a horrendous series of choices, as, as will be discussed uh, extensively in this program. Do you go for a beautiful or for an ugly translation? For whom am I translating? As I'm a tenured professor, I have a salary. As long as I don't commit a major crime, I will continue to be paid. Um, so I have tremendous freedom. And I can experiment with translations all I want. Uh, and I can produce very thick, very ugly translations to expect people, to force people, back toward the source text. It's what um, A.L. Becker, another name that I recommend very strongly to you, a linguist at the University of, University of Michigan, it's what he calls going beyond translation. And the book of his collected essays is called Beyond Translation. Um, I'm, I, I'm simply, what, I, what you have there in English in the handout is simply the referential content, uh, or, or one attempt to render the referential content of the text. Very quickly, what are some of the insufficiencies and exuberances, uh, that is, things that are left out and things that have to be added to have any kind of normal English in this text? First of all, obviously, the sounds cannot be translated. Alliterations and internal rhymes are there, and you can't have the same ones if you're passing from one language to another. Secondly, the words do not have exact translation equivalents. Uh, not only John Locke, but also Wilhelm von Humboldt himself points to the non-translatability of many words. Um, you can paraphrase, you can explain, but there isn't a single word in one language that will exactly cover the semantic field of a single word in another language, in many cases. Not always. You lose gender in going from uh, Kumani to English. Uh, you, the, you lose the fact that the feminine is also diminutive. So the word chari means female bird, but also little bird. Uh, 
you lose the nuance of serial verbs. In North Indian, uh, Indo-Aryan languages, you have series of verbs together. That, and, and one of the verbs will simply nuance the sense of another verb. It's something that happened fast, or it's something that is done for your benefit, or for my own benefit. And, and these things are not, they're not semantic. They're not explicit, but they're real. They're there, uh, and, and you have to decide how you're going to try to translate that into a language that doesn't have that that sort of structure. And finally, and finally, if you go on forever, the syntactic structure of, the, of, the, of each phrase is almost exactly the opposite of the expected of the normal syntactic structure in English. This is a verb final language. Uh, what's going on always comes at the end of the sentence. So you know everybody participating, but you don't know what they're doing <laughs> until the very end. Similarly, in any South Asian language, uh, any language of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, you know all the qualities of something before you know what it is. Uh, and this is used in poetic texts. They, they, they play on this. They create tremendous suspense. And then finally, it's a little bit like German subordinate verbs. You know, uh, German subordinate clauses where the verbs come at the absolute end. And the Irish writer Flann O'Brien wrote, there is no thrill like waiting for the German verb. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the case in all South Asian languages, uh, of, of any language family, North India, South India. Um, all of this is to say that I'm not sure I agree with James Underhill's position in his wonderful new book on verse translation, that it is possible to translate a poem adequately. Given that every level of linguistic structure is potentially activated in poetic language, the best, it seems to me, that you can do is what Robert Lowell called an imitation, choosing to capture some aspects of the original but leaving out a great many others and necessarily imposing new material of your own. Uh, fine. Uh, let me now conclude because I'm sure I've gone over my time. Back to Robert Frost's dictum about poetry, the figure is the same as for love. It begins in delight and ends in wisdom. As to the delight, uh, in 1806, Wilhelm von Humboldt wrote a letter to his friend Carl Gustav Brinkmann, in which he wrote, the high pleasure, der hohe genuss, of entering with each new language into a new system of thinking and feeling, Gedanken uh, und Empfindungssystem, attracts me infinitely. Ziehen mich unendlich an. Now, note how different this pleasure is from Gadamer's goal of a fusion of horizons between languages. Humboldt is not talking about a fusion, but about crossing over into a new place. The goal is not some kind of amalgamation, but first a recognition of the reality of different worlds, and then the willingness to put the work in to learn how to move among these worlds. Drawn to one or another world by elective affinity for its specific difference, its specific qualities, the philologist will dwell in this new territory for a long time. And translation is one possible fruit of this extended, slow experience. The kind of long-term devotion that's represented by philology, and it seems to me a precondition for translation, is summed up by the narrator Marlowe in Heart of Darkness when he's talking about his boat that he's going to use to go up a river into the, into the middle of Africa. Uh, it's, there's a lot wrong with this boat. And he says, but I had expended enough hard work on her to make me love her. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let me wait for the discussion until the discussion session. Um, I'll ask Stephen Doherty. Um, 
who is Professor of American Literature and Culture at the University of Agda in Kristiansand, uh, Norway. 